Hey guys, welcome to episode six of my build out of a guitar kit world ES175 guitar kit. Now, I just said episode six. If you are seeing this episode first, you want to slow down and stop and you want to take advantage of that I card that's popping up right there right now and go backwards and get to the first episode where we opened the kit. I talked a little bit about why a kit versus restoring or salvaging a, a Econo arch top out of the 50s and 60s, which is what I'm actually known for. And then we looked at what it takes to prep the guitar for a finish. Episode 3, we put a weird, really weird finish on this thing using old violin technique. Um, that's going to come back to haunt us a little bit in this episode if we're not careful. Then we glued the neck on, and then in episode five, we themed the guitar with all kinds of historic blues type stuff. What we're going to do this time with this guitar is we're going to take this bag of parts, and we're going to put them on the guitar, and we're going to see if it makes noise. Now, this is the part where I may be critical about the guitar. What do the parts do? Um, how good are they? Uh, do I have to do anything to change the guitar to accept the parts? Um, do they fit? Is, uh, can I damage the guitar by not doing things right? How easy is this for somebody that's never built a guitar to sit down? Now, I will tell you this. When you start getting close to the end on one of these guitars, it's really easy to get sloppy, so you start moving ahead really quick. And this is one of those points where your setup, how the strings are, how the neck is, all that kind of stuff is really important. So we're going to take our time here. Let's go to the bench. I'll walk you through putting the parts on. And this is going to include soldering things up and wiring things up. So let's hit the bench. Okay, first thing we want to make sure is that our guitar is protected. We've got plated parts. We want to make sure that we've got a rag there, we've got our bean bags, we've got our neck stand, we don't want things slipping off and doing all that. So we want to protect our guitar. The next thing we want to remember is we put that fancy finish on this and we basically calcified the top to seal it, to hold sound in, and to make a transition layer for this boiled linseed oil finish. So we want to make sure that we protect that. Um, we also want to think about if we're going to be driving parts in, or doing something that's going to maybe chip this. We don't want to do that, and we're going to see a tool that's handy for that. But we're going to start here with a compensated bridge that most people call a rollomatic bridge. Okay, a rollomatic bridge um, can come in a form of where you've got a typical floating bridge, which has the feet and the thumb screws, or it has a, a post that goes down into the guitar like this and then has thumb wheels that you turn up and down. In this case, they're threaded here like so. And then this sits up on top. And the cool thing about these is you can adjust these forward and back um, because you're fine-tuning the intonation. And we've done, a, we've done an episode about scale and intonation. It was about cigar box guitars. It's right up there right about now wasn't that cool anyway um, it doesn't matter whether it's got one string or 50 the distance between the back of the nut and the 12th fret that needs to be doubled and that's where these individual pieces need to sit and this bridge allows you to adjust these back and forth something I want to show you here is you will always see the bridge tilted on an arch top guitar, at least a difference between the thickness of the biggest string and the smallest string. So they tend to sit this way. In order to compensate for that out of the start, you will notice that one of these holes is further away from the cutout than the other. And that is to compensate for, again, the bigger strings needed to be in a different place. And with these rollomatic type bridges, you can adjust this forward and back. I also want to point out that you can put these on either way. You want to pay attention where your strings are, what's in the way, the pickup and everything. But on the larger strings, the, there's a slope side. You see this is sloped, this is sloped, 
this way, this is sloped this way. And the larger strings, you want to put the slope away from the knot on the smaller strings where it's sloping away from the knot on the smaller strings you want to put them sloping towards the knot so let's take a look at our next challenge these are tight now I've told you in the opening that there's a big block under here so it's solid but that block is attached to the bottom you want to remember you're dealing with an arched curved top here so I can take this hammer and just smack these in no, I want them to be tight. I don't want them to fall out. Now remember, the strings coming off the tailpiece will come over these and help hold them in. But I don't want to drive these in. So I got a little tool here that I want to show you that comes in really handy. It's called a reamer. Now you want to remember, if you have a finish on the guitar, like, like say it's a standard finish on the guitar, and you start to go drilling into things, what happens is the bit hangs up on the edge and starts chipping this out. And because we put that calcified finish on here, it's likely to do the same thing. So what a reamer does is it allows you, let's do a close up here, it's got ridges on it. It's kind of like one of those things that you get pipe, or pipe sprinkler fittings for your lawn sprinklers and somebody kicks off a head, you stick it down there and turn it. But what this does is it allows you to go down in there and turn just a little bit and it reams it instead of drilling it takes off a very little bit and then you can cat, go slowly work that until this fits in snug I don't care if I tap it in once it's in a ways but I certainly don't want to drill this out so this is kind of old school carpenter stuff these also work very handy when you're doing these holes, if there's burrs and stuff, you can just go in and dress these holes out. Or if your potentiometer shaft doesn't fit, these things are handy. They're called reamers. Once I get that close, then I'll go ahead and tap it in. Okay, guys, so by the time I got done, the threads are disappearing off the top of this reamer. And this reamer goes from 1 8 inch to a half inch you really want one of these again if you've got stuff that's here that you're seeing little burrs in before you start don't take a drill to it because you'll end up popping stuff up I really don't want to crack these things or mash out and bug out the bottom but by the time that I get to where this is going to need to be and go nice and straight nice and slow apply the pressure I need to and that way Always blow your stuff out before you pull a reamer out. There we go. And then I can get these really close. Okay. Like so. That one needs a tad more. Well, remember, the hole is tapered. These things are tapered. So there we are. We're really close. Now, I want to show you something else. See if I can do this without dumping in anything on the floor. But if you look in that hole right there, there's a hole going through there if you see it. That's not a mistake. It actually allows you to run a wire through here because remember, we have to ground the strings. And I'm going to do that with the tail piece. Um, I'm going to run a wire. We drilled a hole back here when we got things ready for the tail piece that's back there. So I'm gonna run a wire there. That's how I like to do it. But the kit has given you a way, now that we're ready to put this in like so, okay? We wanna remember that hole is there. I'm gonna take a piece of yellow pushback wire. This wasn't in the kit. Um, you've got everything you need to build the kit. They call this pushback wire because you can do that and it's pre-tinned, meaning it's ready to solder. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm going to take this piece of yellow wire, I'm going to push it through. Now I know I'm going to ground everything to the potentiometers, which are here. So I'm going to cut it a little bit longer than that. I'm going to take another tool, not very expensive, a piece of coat hanger. I'm going to reach down in there and I'm going to pull up that ground wire right there. Make sure it's long enough like so. And then I'm going to loop it through here and tie it back that way it won't come undone don't yank on this and try to 
tow a pickup truck or anything with it, but something like this will do. Now watch what happens. I'm going to take this piece of wire here. Again, protect the top at all times. I'm going to take my wire cutter and I'm going to cut this off to about here. Get this off to the side. And now I'm going to strip off the end of that wire like so. Get the shielding away from it. And then I'm going to bend it downward like an L. You see that? And I'm going to grab the other end of this and I'm going to pull this through to where that L is pointed down and the coated part is inside the hole. Let me see if I can point this out. So that wire went in, it's running through that hole, and the bared metal end of it is hanging down right there. Now what happens is when I put this in, and I'm going to do it very carefully, what's going to happen is the metal part of this stud is going to make contact with that wire. Now I can hang on to this here, and we're just going to tap this in. Watch this. Nice and easy. And now that wire, because it's touching this, will touch the stud that goes in on the thumb screw. And then because this sits up on here, again, slant back on the biggest strings, the strings will be grounded right there. Okay, we've got a couple more stunts up our sleeve. We'll pull this reamer out. We'll make sure everything is okay. We'll fit that. That just takes the slightest tap now. That's a good one. Okay. And do you know what Marvel Mystery Oil is? Voila, the Marvel Mystery Oil is waiting to take you away. I got a little bit. I'm going to put just the tiniest bit on here. Like so. It's conductive. And that way, years from now, these will never get hung up, and everything will work out fine. We'll do that to two of them. Uh, one thing I've noticed about this kit is there is, is a slot up here, just in case these ever get too tight or something. That was a good, nice feature. I like to see some of them don't have that, so then you're over here playing vice grips, and, and who needs that? But um, Marvel Mystery Oil and Loctite. You'll see me using Loctite on the nuts for potentiometers that's something I always do you don't need very much that goes there like that and now last thing remember we can run this up and down it kind of serves the same as this I don't have to tilt anything these are cool but I want to remember you got to figure out where do you want to put your um, screws. Do you want them pointed to the back? you want them to the front? You got to kind of figure out where your pickups are. Your uh, trapeze is going to be here. But either way, you can turn it around. But always remember, the big strings, the slants away from the knot, little strings, travel strings towards the knot. Okay, roll a matic bridge on. I'm going to go ahead and take this off so it doesn't fall off. And we're going to get to work on the tailpiece. Now, I have to admit something. I like the way this ground went to here. That's not the way I usually do it. And I'm a creature. I have it. So notice that this is white wire. And I need to get this where you can see what's going on in the background here. So I'm going to get rid of this. And we're going to birdhouse this thing way up in the air so you can see. Saddle up my pony. There we go. Now, you can tell, you saw episode two, that we already drilled this out for the trapeze tailpiece. You see that? 
except we put an extra hole in the middle right there. And what that hole is for is this white wire. You want to write this down. See, white wire is not yellow wire. And white wire with a blue piece of tape on the end is not anything else. We stick that through the hole in the middle and run it through. And I'll be able to find that down through the pickup hole. You want to get all this done before you start worrying about pickups. Anyway, you can see that I have stripped this back, wound it around itself. And now, when I go to put the trapeze tailpiece on, I'm going to put that screw into that wire like so. And then when I screw it into the hole right here, it's going to ground the strings through the trapeze tailpiece because the strings are attached to the tailpiece to the bridge. Bingo. That is how I usually do it. And I'm going to have to keep doing it that way. So I got two ground wires. I'll tell you what, two ground wires is better than that. Okay, the guitar thinks the blood is running to its head. So guess we'll. I want to ruin a good thing there. All righty then. Let me get this tailpiece put on. So y'all can see that wire right there. And it's wrapped around here, believe me. So we'll put this here. Just want to make sure the clutch on your drill is set very low. You don't want to strip the, these things out. That'll hold that there like so. We'll hand tighten it up at the end. We're going to tape this off. And of course, you know all these screws have to be chick flick teal when I'm done. And that's my artistic purview. But let's move on. All right, guys, we are at a place that right now that can be really intimidating. Um, and that is wiring this thing up. It's got two pickups. It's got a switch that will let you play one pickup. Uh, the other pickup or both. It's got volume and tone controls for each. Uh, and so this is like a full-blown, you know, real guitar, which you would expect. So... If you don't know what to do, this this can be really, really intimidating. So I'm going to start this off by telling you a couple of things. I've done some episodes about soldering. Um, you can look those up and find them somewhere in my channel list by doing a search. But a couple of things that you need to know. First, you got to get some of this pushback wire that's pre-tinned. I have three different colors. If you buy it in bulk... It's good. You're going to need some of that if you're going to do much of this. Um, get a good soldering iron that's got a way of setting the uh, temperature you want. Okay, you want to, you want to get that. Um, most important thing, you want to start off with a clean tip. This is hot, but I am using some uh, 220 grit uh, sandpaper. But I always start off with a file when I'm going to work a project, and I do this every time. And this is, it's going to lose its color right away here because it's getting hot. But here's a trick. Have a wet sponge because every time you touch the solder iron to the sponge, it'll clean off anything, and you need that. You're going to see me doing that a lot. Have a holder for your soldering iron, whatever it is. You know, I used to balance one on this piece of wood here, and then it would roll off and it would burn something, and you don't want that. So I have a holder. These things with these little alligator clips, they call them handy hands or something like that. They're really, really handy. They are. This one has a light. Um, it also has a magnifying glass. I don't really use that that much, but um, what else? Um, have a good supply of shrink wrap. Once you find where they sell this stuff in links, get a bunch of it, put it in a clip, like something like this, and then you can put it away. You want to have things. I see people making the mistake all the time of they'll go to solder something, and then they'll pick the solder uh, iron up, and then if this moves, it turns the solder uh, a joint cold. You can see it gets this weird color instead of uh, being shiny. So... It's always good to have a couple of things that you can hold on to. So you make your soldering connection uh, and then you 
have this bigger stuff. One of these is good. Stay away from the work. Um, have a pair of scissors around. Some chick flick teal scissors is good for cutting shrink wrap. But have little lengths of shrink wrap. When you start getting into soldering things that are close to each other, even if they have um, coated wire, you always want to make sure that nothing's going to touch because once you start getting all these parts in a guitar, you really don't want to be taking the pickups out and going through that hassle to reach up in here and do that kind of stuff. So, um, good wire cutter, a um, couple different size pliers to hold things with, um, the sandpaper, of course, and a file and the wet sponge, and you can't go wrong. Okay, so before we get into the details about the wiring harness from the kit, which, by the way, I'm really happy with, a um, little bit about soldering. Um, you Before you put any wire on, again, we're going to do this. We want to use solder that's for electrical. They make solder that's for plumbing, sweating, copper joints and stuff. You don't want that, but you want to heat up things and they call this tinning so if I um, put a little bit of solder on my soldering iron and then touch whatever I'm going to do that's good it makes it ready to go again you're going to see me touching this all the time don't buy fake sponges they have a weird uh, scent that comes off of meaning some petrochemically based something or other is not good for your lungs but um, okay so Whenever you're going to do a connection like this, you see, this is pushback wire. Um, I can take these little pliers that I have, handy size, and, and see, you just pull back, push back. I just want to put a little kink in the wire like that. And then I want to figure out, am I going to be coming this way or this way? So I want to kind of plan this ahead. And I really don't want to have this moving around. So these little pliers like this and squeezing that down and getting it right are really important. Then, again, it's just a matter of touching this and touch the metal first. Don't try to put the solder on the, the soldering iron. And I expect this to go on the part. And there you go. It's that easy. Good. Let's talk a little bit about the harness that came with this thing. Okay, each pickup has a volume control and a tone control. And you can see there's a capacitor right there. And uh, these are 500 potentiometers. That's what we want. And they're all wired up already. Um, there's nothing to do here. Um, this can be very intimidating if you've never done that before, but there's two of them. There's one with a red wire, one with a yellow wire, and then remember we put um, something for a ground wire that I can either go to the uh, um, trapeze or to the bridge, and there's even the wire for that. So these are ready to go. Um, the ends, I stripped them a little bit already, got ahead of this, pulled back the wire. This is the grounding wire on all of them. Um, they all came that way. This is the jack. I use a different jack on most of my guitars, but we're going to put this one together and use this. But this is long enough. This actually goes up to the three-way switch. Um, if the pickups would have been wired I would virtually have to do no um, soldering at all. Everything came ready. Um, so virtually all I have to do is uh, run a ground to the three-way switch. And I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. And then hook these wires from one pickup to another to this three-way switch and then bundle this stuff and put it in the guitar. I, I, I really couldn't be any happier. Uh, if you get one of these kits and you see this, make a board, put some holes in it. You see, I've got this piece of wood here. These, this piece of wood is with me all the time. 
but it's got a hole in it so I can put potentiometers. Now I usually use a little bit bigger ones, but these are great potentiometers. They're brand name potentiometers. I'm not here to keep people in business, but um, like I said, I couldn't be happy. If you get one of these kits, take a picture of what they've given you because it's like a primer for how to wire uh, a guitar with two pickups and a three-way switch. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do here. Okay, the input jack has a ground, which goes to the ground. So the uh, guitar cord goes into there, touches the ground, and then it's got a hot wire here. This runs up and runs to the three-way switch. Now what the three-way switch does for you is you have two pickups. If you have it in one position, so we'll, we'll show you how this works. You flip it this way. This comes out. It disconnects from one of the poles here and lets just that pickup work. If you flip it all the way over the other way, it only lets the other pickup work. But if you put it in the middle, both pickups work. And the way that works is... The input jack wire goes to the center lug. You can see that those lugs have been pinched together. This goes here. I run my ground off to this ground wire that I've put uh, on the other side where the single pole is. That's the ground. So I hook that in there. And then I basically just take the wire from the pickup and the wire from the potentiometer set and I hook these together and the grounds all together. And I put one of these on this side for this pickup. And then the other pickup will be on the other side. I don't know if you can see that. There's one pickup, the other pickup, and then the input jack comes to here. So when you're flipping switches, if everything is grounded, it all works fine. Again, I cannot begin to tell you how complete this wiring job was done when it hit me. So let's do a little soldering here. Um, everything is good enough here and I've got the, the guitar open. So I'm gonna be able to do all this and then put it inside the guitar. So let's do a little soldering and kick back and watch. So when I showed you these lugs, they're all really close together. And the wire is coated of course, but here's what I like to do. I'm going to pick yellow here. And I'm going to cut a piece of the shrink wrap like so. Okay. And I've got this wire, again, for the input jack, stripped back here. And I'm going to put this piece of shrink wrap. Now, you got to keep this in mind because... If you make your connection, it's hard to do. You want to get the shrink wrap away from where the heat is going to be or, or it will start to activate. But I'm just going to take and cut the end of that off. I just want a little bit, like so, bent over. And then that's going to go in that middle lug like this. Now, what I didn't do, what I told you you really need to do, is... First do that, you see how all that's coming off there. Now I'm gonna take my solder and I'm gonna just touch this right here. And tin that just a little bit, not enough to close up the holes. Do that again. Get my wire. Right through there. You want to be patient doing this. We're going to take our little pliers. We're going to crimp that like so. We want to make sure that there's nothing sticking out. You get a stray wire, that's not going to be good. I'll use that sponge to do that. And then we'll just take our solder and...
you know, never take your eyesight for granted. In fact, give a donation to a group that helps people with glasses or something because I'll tell you what, some of the teachers that taught me the things I know in school that I didn't really wasn't that great with them, uh, ones that taught me how to type and read and that kind of thing. There's so many things as we get older that we'd just be lost without that we take for granted when we're young. Okay, so now I'm coming to the other side and I touch it and it just starts to melt. Make that hole go away. There we go. The dry again, if you see your connection becoming turn a weird color, that's not good. So once that's done, now I can take and slide down my shrink wrap like this and get it close. And sometimes the lug is just right. And your shrink wrap is just right where you can push it down onto the lug like that. Now I can just take a match and my soldering iron and get that to shrink. Well, that's a handy trick, huh? So anyway, we're just going to flip this like so and do it quickly before it burns my finger, but... There's our shrink wrap. And what that will do is it will stop the other wires from touching each other here because, you know, they're light wires. So what we are going to do is we're going to pick out. Um, I like these pickups because they're stamped in there. It says N and it says B. So you know which one's your neck and you know which one's your bridge. So you're going to pick the one. Uh, I'm. So here's the way this works. I forgot to tell you about this. If you switch this one and you want your bridge pickup to be in that position, good. But what if you do it the wrong way? Well, you just flip this around inside the guitar. But I'm going to want this one to be, be my bridge uh pick up and this other one to be my neck pick up. So I'm basically you don't have to sit here and watch me do this. I know it's very exciting, but let's get this in here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the wires from each pickup. I'm going to pick uh, one that I want to go to the bridge um, and I'm going to wire these together here. We got the ground and the hot wires. Now I could have also wired the bridges to the uh, middle lug of the volume pot, which you can see that's what they did there. There's uh, the hot wire and the ground, so it's running up here. I could have run this one to there and, done, and done, did the same thing, but again, it was it was completed for me. So I'm just basically going to put these two together, so I've got a ground and two hot wires, twist those up, and I'm going to put those on one lug here, run the rest of the ground that I put on, and do the same thing with the others. So I have one here, one here, and everything grounded up. I don't want to be redundant, but I know it would have been nice if I would have had somebody explain this to me when I started. I'm going to cut a little a bit of shrink wrap and since the neck pickup and the neck set of volume and tone controls are going together I'm going to put those together and twist them up like that and then I'm going to put that little piece of shrink wrap right there and I'm going to pull it down out of the way and then I'm going to go ahead and solder this onto the top connection there like so.
Okay, now once you know that that's cooled on to that lug, you're going to take your shrink wrap and you're going to slide it down. And then we're going to take our match and These two cannot touch each other and short each other out. Okay, so we've rolled the switch over, wired the other one up the same way, put a piece of shrink wrap on there, and we tinned this. Sometimes when you're tinning, you got to be careful that you don't close the hole up. But there we go. These little pliers are very very handy and I hope you can see that that shrink wrap protecting these things for each other from each other is a good thing uh, because sometimes what happens is after a while all of your pickups are on um, and you don't know why and it, maybe you don't want them all on if you did you wouldn't be wiring this three-way switch in right but because these things start touching each other after a while. The more you get into this, the more you'll learn the importance that you don't want to skimp on these switches because they tend to break down after a while if you do. We're going to let that cool. Again, don't move it too quick. If that solder is not shiny, you got a cold joint. And we're just going to push that down now. And do our old matchbook trick there Let me get this out of the way and you'll be able to see that with some due diligence there's no way that these are going to touch each other now i'm going to want to bundle these up once they're all done and put a wrap around them so they don't flop all over the place and work loose and now all we got to do is take this wire. We're going to put a piece of shrink wrap over it, wind up all these other grounds, hook those to each other, and this will be done. Okay, last thing. I've wound up all the grounds. I've taken the uh, pushback wire I put from the ground lug over to the other side, wound all those together. Um, everything is either shrink wrapped or whatever on the hot wire, so nothing is going to get to this. So we're just going to take a little solder and we're going to make sure that these don't go anywhere by putting a little solder on them to keep them all together. There we go. Clean off that soldering iron, let that calm down a little bit. And then we're just going to push this shrink wrap over the whole mess and pull it in like so and melt that. And we are done and we can put all this into the guitar. A couple little tricks about feeding wires I'll show you in a minute. Okay, guys, here we go. We got everything in place. You got all the wiring down in here. You want to make sure that everything's in place before you start putting the pickups in. And now we're going to take a piece of coat hanger, a magnet, some dental floss, and some bacon flavored toothpaste. So we're going to fish all this stuff into place because this thing's fixing to come alive. A couple other things. I got a few short pieces of wire. We're not going to let uh, the excess wire flop around inside the guitar so those will come in handy we'll keep them there and then I also have some zip ties that are the appropriate size same kind of thing um, we are going to start we have the ground wires we got come one coming from the bridge which is what came stock in the kit there was a hole in there we saw that a little bit earlier and then I put another one back here so on the wiring harness, there's a place to hook these up. Again, the wiring harness was incredible. The work was easy. But we're going to start off with probably the worst one to get to, and that is the three-way switch right up here. All right, so I did an episode called Flossing Your Arch Top, and it kind of showed you this little trick. I think there's an episode link right up there. But anyway, 
we just take some dental floss like this and we cut it and we just throw a loop in it like this like so let's see how old I am just flip that around there like that okay I'm gonna take this I'm gonna put it down in here then I'm gonna take I could tie a washer on it whatever but I'm gonna take this now and I'm just gonna hook this here and pull it towards me so now that's in there pretty snug I can just snip off my dental flosser and wind it like that and there we go I just put my retainer nut on there and I'm not going to tell you guys but at the very end my trick is I'm going to put my hand in here make sure it's the way I want it and let me grab another tool I got to show you something really cool okay I got a couple things in my box of tricks have you ever seen one of these it is a wrench it has teeth on one side here smooth opposite here it is for grabbing a hold of things like this and turning them in so my hand is going to be in the way here let's see if I can do this I'll grab a hold of wires and I can point it the way I want and then I just see what's going on here this turns this and I can get it nice and tight without marring everything up this also works good over here you can't see but for potentiometer nuts that are coming loose and I've got another little tool that works for jacks like this so I got that nice and snug this is pointed the way I want it we'll put that off to the side and now secret weapon is I've got a piece of paper towel and some Loctite and I'm going to go along the edge of that and I'll put a piece of paper towel here now watch this if I put the Loctite on the paper towel it'll seep through the towel and onto the threads if you just go like this it's going to be all over the place but I take this little squeeze belt and I put just a tad of Loctite there and that will stop that from coming loose for a real long time a lot of guitars have problems with these switches because you're always working them and you need to be able to make sure that at some point in this guitar's life this is probably going to need to be changed out. But that's on there now. I'm not going to put the button on it, but I'm going to make sure that it flips one way or the other. Now, if it's not flipping, it's kind of flipping that way and this way. So if I want it to flip straight up and down or off to the side like this, I can just take this and without holding it, the whole thing turns. Do you see that? Now it's flipping this way like so. And I think I'll leave it like that. There we go. Everything is working. Now this wiring harness that's here from that pickup, I want to make sure that I get everything unwound along the way here and bundled up right so we're going to get the wires that are running to that pot and that switch out of the way here make sure that they're not all wound up a little bit of time here is going to make a huge difference later so we're going to unwind this a little bit I could have been a little bit more prepared here but that's the way this works okay here we go so now I'm going to pull these together with each other and I'm going to take a zip tie and pop that together right there get them nice and straight as possible cinch that up. You always want to put things together like you think they're going to need to be 
cut at some point in the future so give yourself some room um, don't let stuff fall down in the guitar at this point okay so now this is the neck pickup so it goes up here like so and I can get it ready to drop in and I can probably take a little bit more slack out of that I think I will so I'll just pull this back like so. Yeah, just figure out how not to have a bunch of slop in there. Okay. Go take that wire off right there. Use one of these little bit longer wires here. Somebody ever has to take this apart, they will be very happy with me, trust me. Okay, those go up. That one is ready to sit down in there. Like so. Everything is pre-drilled. Remember, we drilled all these holes before we did the finish so nothing's going to get marred up now you want to remember these things are plastic so you don't want to just be going at them with a drill and cracking them and stuff because I'll tell you what one of the worst jobs in the world is to compress the springs on this that lets this go up and down but I think you get the idea now we're going to go over here and get into which one of these sets of volume controls and potentiometers goes where and then we have to remember that one of them has a ground wire off of it that we're going to need to connect to the ground to the bridge and tailpiece. All right now before we get moving ahead too fast I want to remember I want to put my pick up so I'm going to get this up in the air where we can see it. I want to get my input jack put in back here Okay, so I'm going to need, I'm going to need to be over here like this so I can reach in here. Yeah, sealing up these pickup holes, I'll tell you what, working on these old arch tops that just have F holes in it, not cutting pickup holes in is kind of a pain. But okay, so I got my coat hanger, I'm using the other end of it now, I've got a piece of dental floss over here still tied off to its container now watch I'm going to take with that piece of masking tape there it's just wrapped around there like that you see and I'm going to roll it up to where it gets through here and then I'm just going to bring it up through the F hole like that right there see that I'm going to unwind the tape a little bit and I am going to take my chick flick teal scissors and I'm going to cut this off here and I'm going to put the loop away from the tape I'm going to put the tag end or the loose end towards the tape there bend it over and I'm going to pull that out you see that now I can take this end and do my double loop here like so. I used to do this a lot better with a loading chain and somebody screaming at me. I want to make sure I get these ground wires out of the way. Anyway, I'm just going to pop that on there and cinch them up. And then do the calf rope and move right away like I'm at the rodeo. Then I get this down in here where it goes and I can just feed this through. And once it gets here, I'll pop it through. Okay, now I have another little stunt I need to show you here. If I can get up off the floor. I'm going to pull this back out. Look, I had a piece of toothpick 
behind there. Now, I want to show you this thing. If you ever have one of these coming loose and you don't want to spin everything, you just put this on here down in the shaft, hold it, and then it grabs the nut for you and tightens everything up. If you don't use one of these, what ends up happening is the thing spins around in there and your soldering comes loose. But again, this is a rubber tip. It fits down in the jack and then that fits the nut. It's a little expensive gadget, but I'll tell you what, every time you do maintenance on a guitar, it's a pretty handy way to check that nut because if you don't, fishing one out is terrible, but there we go. Okay, now I got the grounds coming off the bridge and the tailpiece. I'm going to put this piece of big shrink wrap here and I'm going to wrap the ground coming off one of the volume pots that will hook everything to everything else that's grounded. And I'm going to take and put a little bit of solder right there. It's all wrapped around each other so it won't come undone. And as always, that tip always gets cleaned. We're going to let that cool off a little bit. We're going to slip that shrink wrap up there like that. And then we'll burn the place down like this. We're going to feed the potentiometers now. What I've done is I've made a loop. When you tie to the potentiometers, don't tie the loop off of dental floss down here because it won't want to come up in the hole. It's going to struggle the way it is. You want to make sure that you test before uh, you go to putting these in that uh, the holes are right. If not, you can just take your ream or don't take a drill. Just take your ream or and do whatever you need to do there. But I've got this piece of bent coat hanger that's unlike this. You can bend these any way you want and then just keep them in your uh, drawer. But I'm going to start here. This is the tone control for the bridge pickup. I want it to be down there so I'm going to pop this through here. There. I'm going to bring it up through here. You see how that works? That's why that bend is like that. Okay, let's see if we can fish this last potentiometer in in 59 seconds or less. Got the dental floss on. Here we go. We're going in, people. Pop that off of there. And... Ooh, look at that. We're doing good. Where's the knot? And the washer. Oh, I dropped it. Wasting precious seconds, but I think I got a little time to waste there, right? There we go. Oh, how we doing? Oh, we're getting close. Bingo. All right, there we go. I'm going to use a secret weapon here, a little bit of paper towel, and a drop there, drop there, there, and there. There we go. Easy money. All right, we're going to put a set of 12s on it now and see what it will do. Yeah, that's a big beefy string. Let's see if we can snap the neck off this thing, all right? Okay, guys, we are putting on this pit guard. Now, I had to cut it down a little bit. I would have had to shape the stock one anyway, it's made out of a piece of Mississippi license plate and what's funny is it reflects in the dark so if it's playing in a gig you'll see the license plate stand out like a sore thumb but 
I pre-drilled the mounting hole with a very small bit there, smaller than what the Chick Flick Teal screw that I'm going to use is going to require. And then I put a dab of Duco cement and I also use these little foam washers underneath the holes. So there's two holes here. You can also use those old rubber, uh, I don't know what they call, maybe grommets that when you ran a wire so you could hook up your 8-track tape player in your 1967 Chrysler Newport, the wire didn't rub up against the uh, firewall and short everything out. So yeah, always put one of these. Anytime something can move around a little bit, it doesn't strip out so soon. So we just have everything pre-drilled. If you're going to use a license plate, just remember that the edges cannot be sharp. You got people playing the kind of music that people play on my guitars are freaking out. So you want to make sure that that edge is not razor blade sharp. There we go. Okay, we're using the strap button. We're putting it on the bottom of the trapeze. Again, I used a grommet in there. Um, the hole was pre-drilled. Remember, the grounding wire is underneath here. This is not something I want to run in with a bit driver or a drill. I want to tighten this up by hand because you don't want to strip this out or snap this off. That creates for a lot of problem. Okay, we're going to put the other strap button on here now. And you want to remember when the guitar is upside down, sometimes it's easy to get things twisted around. Um, and you'll see here in a second what I'm talking about. When we put a strap button on, um, you'll see me sometimes bolting necks on with um, a, a steel bolt and an aviation or stop uh, knot nylon insert knot on the back of the guitar and you'll see me running them in right here um, when you got a bolt running through everything that's one thing but when you got a little screw like this one holding everything on you want to think about over the years with the strap button right here loading is constantly yanking this way right here now if you put the strap button over here like so half of the strap weight instead of being right here, is going to wrap around here. So you got a lot of load bearing right here. Um, so I'm going to put it right over here, off center. People may not understand why I do that, but that's why. I'm going to start off with a very small bit. And notice that I have this area taped off. That way, when I screw this in, everything doesn't get damaged. Remember, we've got that fancy finish on here there we go perfect again strap goes on here comes across here and a lot of the weight of the guitar and the bouncing around the guitar gets absorbed right here instead of being here and yanking this way and working everything loose all right we're getting into the fine details now i hope i'm zoomed in enough for you to see but um I've got the bridge set up uh, pretty good. The uh, strings are quite up off the deck, so this is ready to play slide. But even that, I'm coming down the individual string, and I've got a dead string. So how you do this is, let's go on this side. I'm coming down. This is the old do, re, mi, fa, lo, whatever, that your music teacher, Mrs. Todd, in Camp, Missouri, 1967-ish, would teach you. Anyway, there's no gap in this. You hear this? So I can go into all the strings that way. But, but I get to this one here. Oh, it starts to dead out right there. Hear that? And then it stops and picks back up. Well, the string that it stops at that, that fret is a little bit high, and that's this one right here. So it's actually the 13th fret that's a little high. 
the rest of this, I have not touched this uh, fret board at all, any of the frets. So they're, out of the whole deal, there's one that's a tad high, and it's only high on this side, but not the bass side, see? I go to, so just on the other side of the radius is the problem on one fret. You can't beat that. So when it comes to fine tuning that, uh, these kinds of problems, you all know what a fret rocker is. It looks like this. And the reason it has different sides and lengths is because you get further up towards the top, the distance between the frets is different. They get closer as they come down here. So, for example, the space on top lets you jump between three frets and see, will this rock back and forth? That's called a fret rocker. And then as you move down, they get closer together. And then finally at the very end, they do this. So if I go in this area where this problem is right here, yeah, I can rock this just a little tiny bit. Now, that would mean I take all the strings off and I take a couple of tools that I have, like, let me dig in here. I wasn't prepping really well, but this is a handy tool. But this will go right under the frets or the strings, and I can do this. It has diamond uh, fragments in it. This is a $100 item. If you're going to do a lot of this work, you need one of these. It's also the best nail file you could possibly have, so keep it hid. But they make fret rockers that have the centerpiece is just a tad taller, and it also has the same diamond fragments on each one of these. So if you run across one of these like this fret right here, I don't have to take the strings off. I can just put this here and rub it back and forth and you can tell when everything is fine because the noise will stop. There it is right there. I can feel it. But when that stops, you're going to come back and go just a tad more. Again, I can use this to come in on this side and file just a little bit like this. until that disappears. There we go. Easy money. You've got $200 here in these two items, but I'll tell you what, they'll save a lot of money if you do this kind of work. But really, the way this came stock is, that's the minimal amount of work I had to do, so good deal. I want to tell you, if you do have to get into a fret pretty, pretty significantly, they're crowned off. They make files that you can see are concave like this. Uh, this one has two different sides. Now, if your frets are old and they're low and you start doing this and nothing is happening and you see that your fret board is getting hit, then that's a different problem. But if you don't have strings on, we can go to that fret we just did and go like this, or we can take our diamond file and come in at the edge and make sure that anything that we did gets concaved back around. These need to be rounded off. They can't be flat. Once you start getting one fret out of whack, and then the next things, everything is starting to get out of whack. Now, finally, as I tune this guitar, I got a tuner up here. So if I want this string to be D, and I go down to my 12th fret, it should be D, but an octave higher. And so, when I push, and it's a little bit sharp, what that means is we've got a graduated bridge here. Let me move this down. Remember, I was telling you about the roller bridge, and these things go back and forth. I can take a screwdriver and adjust each one of these individually. Now, remember me telling you that these can be switched around okay, as long as the slope goes back away from the knot on the three bass strings and towards the knot on the treble strings, which gives you that intonation curve that you see on an arch top that it just has a floating bridge. Anyway, I'm going to go to the 12th fret on each of these and adjust this until I get the same note an octave higher on 
when I strum the 12th fret. There we go, that took less than an eighth of a turn. I'm gonna walk down each one of these and make sure that the same thing happens. I tune the string to open, whatever I want it to be. is D, A, D, F sharp, A, D. Write that one down, you'll never hear it again. I could tell you the different people who have that tuning, but I don't wanna be dead at the end of the day. So we'll go to the next one. Got to tune that up just a little bit. This thing's getting used to life. You want to remember, if nothing is happening, when you're moving these things, sometimes it's because you have to pull the string up and then everything will adjust down. There we go. So all these strings are the note they're supposed to be and an octave above when we play them on the 12th fret like this. It's that simple. Again, the fretboard come in straight, nice, one fret to work on. That's pretty incredible. Okay, so we're going to take this thing to the bench. We're going to stand it up, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to get really critical about what I would have different. And I need you to know, before we get going here, there's no reason, absolutely no reason for me to be a liar. Let's do this. Okay, first time, tuners. Um, this is probably the point where I'm going to be most critical. Um, but I need to frame this out first. There is some wiggle when the strings aren't on in the tuners, in the tuner shafts, back and forth. Okay, let's be fair. I did an episode about tuners. I think if I've got a car left, it'll be right up there right about now you can buy a tuner an open tuner open geared tuner for two dollars okay you can buy a tuner like goes on this guitar with gear and closed body for three dollars and fifty cents and then you can buy a tuner that's fifty bucks each so i think that the thing i'm talking about here that i want to point out is once you get everything together if there's some bagginess in here and this moving back and forth, after a while, the gear that's in there, if it's tilted this way, is going to wear here or wear there. And things wear out after a while, and then things don't want to stay in tune. So it matters whether or not you're playing constantly and tuning constantly and going through all kinds of tunings. You see a lot of people having different guitars are set up for tuning. But that right there is a difference, and there's different price points. So... Let's be fair about this. I am not going to get a million dollar guitar for under 500 bucks. And remember, I can buy a tuner for $2. I can buy a tuner for $3.50. Or I can buy a tuner that costs $50 each. This kit is available with upgrades. Think about that. But if you're just going to be a casual player, these will be fine. Moving on down the line. The next thing that I would think about is that three-way switch right there. These things, again, can get very expensive. This one works fine right now. But if there's one thing that works out on a guitar that wears out, flipping back and forth, and you've got somebody set up with their tone and volume controls for one pickup to do one thing and one to do the other, you are going to have to make sure that that switch is really durable. Again, for somebody that's a casual player that's not going to be having this thing on stage every day, that will work fine for you. When it came to the hardware, I don't have a problem with these. I haven't adjusted these up. They're plenty bright, even uh, lower on the strings. The tailpiece is really, really solid. The pots were brand name. The knobs, um, if you like that style, they're great. They went on good. They're, they're built really well. Um, I don't have a complaint with any of this stuff. Last thing I want to show you is that right there. Come on, zoom in camera. 
There we go. Get closer. Anyway, it's the jack. I personally don't like those kinds of jacks too much. I use a pin and jack. But, um, again, it's you're not going to get a $50,000 guitar at a price point of under $500. Virtually nothing to see on the back. Uh, but I couldn't be happier. Everything was here. Um, oh, I do want to touch up on one more thing. The whole reason we went with this kit is because of that neck pocket and how durable it is. I put 56 string on here. I could put a 60 on here. It's not going to budge. And All right, guys, there we go. Um, another long episode as usual, but here's the bottom line. I have gone through this kit. I've been very critical. Um, and here's the lesson. If you're doing old arch tops, and especially if you're looking for ones that have cutaways like junk bodies and stuff, if you can get a body and a neck that is durable for the price point outside of everything else that came with this guitar, you've got yourself a deal. Now, don't forget, if you're seeing this is the first episode you've seen, you want to start over, there's a playlist right up here, start to finish, we open this thing, and I've shown you how to do virtually every step along the way. There's a lot of amateur luthier stuff in here that you might find, whether you're after a kit like this or not. But uh, don't forget to check out that list. Give me a like and a subscribe if you haven't. And now the real test is, does it have Tammy's signature on it? Does it have a Paul Miro Junk Pile guitar sticker on it? And is it graced with the Grease Zerk in case your plane gets rusty? The answer is yes, so I'm good with it. You should be. But we're going to go out in the next episode and find somebody that can play this thing and get a slide working on it. And until then, I will see you later.